The global food supply is facing vast challenges. Uneven distribution of food, climate change, food loss and waste, malnutrition and obesity. With a growing population, we must collaborate to ensure a reliable supply of sustainable, safe, high quality food to consumers all over the world, both now and in the future. Somewhere in the world, there's the perfect food business partner for you. A partner who can help grow your business in the global food arena. A business area characterized by enormous growth. It's highly likely that your future food business partner will come from Denmark. Even though our own agricultural area is relatively modest, Danish food production feeds three times our own population. Denmark is one of the market leaders in both primary and processed food production, food equipment and ingredients industry, know-how and research. Doing business with the Danish food cluster, you become a part of tomorrow's opportunities and solutions. In Denmark, successful researchers, entrepreneurs and food producers are already future-bound when it comes to their knowledge of resource efficiency, sustainability and innovation. Let's collaborate across nations to convert the global challenges into opportunities. Food Nation is a public-private partnership established by the Danish government and leading private organizations and companies working as a gateway for international stakeholders seeking information about Danish food solutions. Join the Danish food cluster as a business partner or build a career in a field where you will contribute to creating change and discovering better solutions of tomorrow. Hi and welcome to the Market Inside webinar about Japan. My name is Marianne Rispel. And my name is Lise Weber. Mm -hmm. And we've been looking so much forward to welcome you all today uh, to make a deeper dive into the Japanese market. Today, uh, we have uh, Jesper Vibe Hansen with us today, Minister Councillor at the Embassy of Denmark in Japan, and uh, Frank Asmussen, CEO in Robot at Robot. It is possible to ask questions along the session, uh, and we will answer as many as possible uh, in the end in the Q&A session. So um, I would like to, uh, to share my screen now and say, say thank you to Lisa. Um, And suddenly I, yeah, sorry. And make a closer look to the agenda. Here it is, here it is. So we will start out with the, an introduction to the key findings from the inside report of Denmark as a food nation, focusing on the market specific knowledge uh, for Japan and how you can use these information in your local sales and marketing activities. Then Jesper Vive Hansen, Minister Consular at the Embassy of Denmark in Japan, will speak about the market uh, and the current situation in Japan and look into uh, opportunities and possible pitfalls. We will give the floor to Frank Rasmussen, CEO at Rawbite, who will share his experiences doing business on the Japanese market, how to work with health and sustainability and what Danish companies should think of in order to succeed. And then we will show you where to find the inside report and related materials um, and Food Nation's upcoming activities. So every year Food Nation develops an inside report on Denmark as a food nation focusing on how Denmark is perceived on chosen markets as an agriculture and food country. We are focusing on uh, brand awareness, unique selling points, and uh, brand awareness um, this year about health and sustainability. This report is the fourth of a forthcoming series of reports and is focusing uh, on health and sustainability and how that supports exports towards a green transition. 
There is a real need for sustainable, healthy diets that promote all aspects of individual health and well-being while protecting the environment. But the question is whether key international partners are aware of Denmark as a supplier for healthy and sustainable products and solutions. These questions um, we're asking uh, decision makers in Japan, South Korea, the United Kingdom and Vietnam within the food and agriculture sector in collaboration with Opinion. The study consists of a survey amongst 803 international decision makers on the four markets. All decision makers are from companies working with agriculture or food products and solutions. The unaided awareness of Denmark was revealed by asking decision makers to list countries that spontaneously come to mind as established food and agriculture nations. Zooming in on the overview of unaided brand awareness, we can see that Denmark is ranking quite high compared to the size of the country. China, followed by the US, Japan, France, and Germany has the highest awareness among the international decision makers, excluding the decision makers' own home country. We can also see that uh, Denmark is associated with several positive characteristics, and uh, it is characteristic like quality, um, it stands out as the most important characteristic followed by sustainability, organic and food safety and closely followed by reliable, innovative and healthy. The percentages are not that diverse, uh, which implies that Denmark is, uh, is strong on, uh, on several parameters. So health and sustainability uh, are close related concept we can see in our results for 2022, according to 82% of decision makers and being sustainable is the top health challenge in the decision makers home countries. So let's put uh, a spotlight on, uh, on the Japanese market and I would like to invite Lise back to the stage. Thank you very much, Mayenne. And uh, it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to zoom in on this important export market for Denmark. So uh, Denmark is actually um, one of the countries that is uh, ranked uh, relatively high uh, by the Japanese decision makers. If we look at the um, geographical distance that we have to Japan, and also a relatively low export flow at only 2% between the two nations. At the same time, Japan is the country where 72% of the decision maker mentioned Denmark as a leading agriculture and food nation when we actually ask them to think of um, these different countries. Uh, at the same time, uh, 34% claims that they really do not know much about the Danish agriculture and food products and solutions. So, of course, these numbers indicate that we really have a good opportunity to raise awareness on the Japanese markets among the decision makers and in that way also uh, grow the opportunities for exports. So um, let's take a closer look at uh, the fact that Marianne also uh, raised the fact that how are we actually competing amongst other countries, other nations when we are on the global markets. So when we ask the Japanese decision makers, they uh, tend 68% of them uh, mention their own country when we ask them to uh, mention countries that pops up in their mind, uh, thinking about agricultural food products and solutions relevant to their industry. And uh, this is really important to be aware of because this is the main competitor, the, the home market, when we are going out there uh, and trying to export the Danish um, products and solutions. Um, what should we then highlight 
in the dialogue with the Japanese decision makers? Well, uh, when we ask these people to highlight the most important attributes um, when, when they uh, think of agriculture and food production, well, 9% mention cooperation, 7% mention animal welfare, 8% mention quality. So these are the three most important attributes that you could really use actively in your branding and marketing work when you want to approach a Japanese decision makers. This is where we should drive brand awareness, where we have the possibility to grow brand awareness and in that way um, make the door even more open to Danish exports. Um, if we move on and uh, take a closer look at this year's theme, as Marianne said, we have been zooming in on health and sustainability and how specifically these two themes are uh, important drivers for the green transition. Well, 90% of the Japanese decision makers mention that their company's customers are demanding more healthy food products and solutions. 94% mention that health will become more important to their company in the coming years. And 83% mention that being able to contribute to the healthy food products and solutions is an increasing important trait parameter. So we really have an open door here in order to get the attention from the Japanese decision makers, because in Denmark, we, we stand strong on exactly these areas. So in general, 54% of the Japanese decision makers say that Danish food and agricultural products and solutions are among the most healthiest in the world. So we can actually really contribute to the demand that we are seeing growing on the Japanese market. So it's of course interesting to take a closer look on how this development within health um, is moving on on the Japanese market. What do we need to improve health throughout the value chain? It's really important for us to state that this uh, image analysis covers the whole value chain. So we have both been in dialogue with the stakeholders in the primary sector and along the value chain. So what we, um, when we ask uh, the Japanese decision makers uh, how they view the role uh, of how to implement solutions, well, 77% mentioned natural ingredients and products are one way to improve the global health uh, 97 uh, percent mention a food system focused on food security and safety throughout the value chain is really important for health. And 74 percent mention investments in new technology as very much needed to improve health throughout the value chain. So if we zoom in on how do the Japanese decision makers actually understand health? What do they associate uh, when we are thinking about agriculture and food sector and health? And the top three um, uh, perspectives mentioned in this area is first of all, organic, it's food safety and it's sustainability. So these three areas should be mentioned if you want to get into a dialogue with the Japanese decision makers regarding health, because this is how they understand the, the, the theme of health. Uh, so if we sum up the, this year's uh, image analysis results, there's certainly a potential to grow this awareness of Denmark as a food nation. We do have a strong image and health and sustainability, we see that has become more important and it will become even more important in the years to come. So you should look into the possibilities of drive 
uh, awareness within the, the themes of organic, within uh, also uh, cooperation, sustainability, and animal welfare. So these are the themes which could be a driver in order to grow awareness on the Japanese markets. Um, it's, it's of course important to be aware of that organic is understood in a different way on the Japanese market than in Denmark. Uh, so we see in general in all the Asian markets that the, the correlation between organic uh, products and, and production methods have a strong connection to food safety. Uh, whereas in Denmark or this part of the world, we have a more broad understanding of the term of organic. But in general, we stand strong, as you all probably know on this area. So we should also use it uh, as a lever to get more um, awareness on the Japanese market. So we should, of course, also uh, look into the possibilities of communicating food safety and hygiene standards, because the Japanese decision makers widely regard Denmark as a source of technological solutions that can support the development of healthy food products. And uh, with these words, I will round off this short presentation, but I will let you know that we have not uh, we have not shown you all the results, and I will really recommend you to take a closer look at the details in the inside report, which you, of course, can find online on our website. So for now, thank you very much for listening, and I'll give the floor back to Marianne. Thank you so much, Lise, for, for sharing uh, the key uh, findings from the, the inside uh, report. Um, and as Lisa said, uh, you can find much more information uh, in, the, in the print version and also in the digital version. And we'll send you to you after this webinar. So now I would like to invite Jesper Wiese Hansen, Minister Consular at the Embassy of Denmark in Japan, um, to the screen. And then the thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, Mayan. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa. Thank you for inviting me and uh, hosting this event and for doing these uh, market insights. I think they are tremendously valuable uh, also to us as an embassy, uh, since they confirm a lot of the things that we actually see on a day to day basis. I just need to find my presentation now, since it is not appearing on my screen. There we go. Okay, let me uh, just start with a small disclaimer. There's a lot of uh, statistical information in this uh, presentation and also in the market insight. I just want to make use of a, a quote from the former uh, UK Prime Minister Disraeli, who said most people use statistics like a drunk man uses a lamppost more for support than illumination. I think it's quite uh, important to remember, to interpret and to question statistics. I've also been uh, instructed by Food Nation that I have 15 minutes and not a whole lot more time. So I will jump right into it. And some of the information I will, I will skip pretty quickly. On this first slide, I won't go too much into, the de in, into detail. I think you know many of these uh, information and figures, but I would like to say COVID-19 has kept the market closed for a long time. That's obviously important since Japan is a very relationship uh, driven market. So when you cannot meet the people in person, no matter how good that uh, webinars or, or video meetings are, person to person meeting is uh, very, very important. And that is once again possible. There are no restrictions. If you uh, travel from Denmark to Japan, you automatically get a three month visa upon entry. Important to remember that. Also market access. There is an EU Japan uh, free trade agreement. It's called the economic partnership agreement is in place and will uh, actually allow for many products to come in with 0% duty, which can be a tremendous uh, advantage. 
also here uh, in in the bottom of this slide you see you see uh, the export the total danish export and the part that uh, food and agriculture plays play uh, plays uh, the latest figures for the first 10 months uh, i have uh, show even an increase of uh, of 13% in 2022 so positive very quickly uh, agriculture and also food pr production as a result in japan is uh, or has come into what some would uh, call a perfect storm Japan is, as you see here, characterized by very low self-sufficiency rates, both when it comes to food, feed, and fertilizers. They will have to import a lot of these products, and they will have to do that in a situation where world market prices typically have increased dramatically. And to make matters worse, they have to pay by a yen that has depreciated considerably over uh, recent years. In here, uh, I try to demonstrate uh, what the, the situation in, in terms of currency. You can see that, uh, first of all, a lot of the trade in, in food products and, and uh, feed products, uh, a lot of the, 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 the trade is done in US dollars. And you can see here that the uh, exchange rate uh, has really affected the US dollar that has increased in value by 21% compared to, uh, this is 24th of October 21, not 22, uh, as I've written here, I'm sorry about that, uh, against the US dollar and against the Euro, not as much, uh, it stands at an increase of 11%. So all in all, this means a, a relative uh, increase in competitiveness of the uh, European companies uh, compared to American companies. And I personally think that this is partly the reason that we see increases in, in exports uh, out of Denmark also. And just today it was announced by the Japanese authorities that uh, Japan have experienced in 2022 the largest export or trade deficit ever recorded. Jumping ahead in this presentation, um, Japan has a, a number of other uh, huge challenges. As, as you probably know, most of Japan is covered by mountains that cannot be used for agricultural production. And only 11% of the land area is uh, uh, arable. In Denmark, this, the equivalent uh, percentage is 61. So Japan do not have a lot of land available for farming production. And on top of that, you have a rapidly aging farm community. Uh, you have very small and typically heavy, heavily uh, subsidized farms in Japan. Uh, and uh, you have on top of that acute labor so shortages. And at the moment also, you are, uh, or they are battling, um, they are battling a number of animal diseases like in Europe, uh, highly pathogenic uh, avian influenza, but also classical swine fever, which is bothering them uh, at the moment. But despite this, the Japanese authorities actually have a policy in place in order to expand their self-sufficiency rates up to 45% by 2030, and not, not least also a, a target of actually uh, increasing export of food products a fivefold for the for the coming years, which is a bit of an interesting element. Now, turning our our eye towards Denmark and how Denmark is perceived in uh, in Japan, I recognize and, and respect a lot of the findings in the Market Insight report. Um, Denmark is a quality label in itself in, uh, in Japan. Uh, Danish farmers have actually been in Japan since 1923. So we are about to celebrate the centennial of their arrival in Hokkaido in 1923. Since 1998, I believe we have conducted a so-called Danish campaign. This has been focusing on uh, both pork products and dairy products. And on the right side of this slide, you can see how it has typically, typically been used uh, by way of placing logos on products that carry 
uh, Danish pork or dairy products. The wavy logo is pork and the straight logo is, uh, is dairy products. And you, you see that in, in, in this example. The campaign, which uh, has run for many years, has been focusing on clean, safe and fresh. Exactly some of those attributes that, uh, that you see in the market inside. And uh, I think uh, this has helped and contributed to, uh, to um, the recognition uh, that you see in Japan amongst professional players in the market. We are now, <clears throat> and I'll not go too much into that, but we're now starting a social media campaign focusing on, on sustainability. We call it sustain because as I will get back to, that's one of the new uh, elements uh, of interest in the market. I will spend a little bit more time on this, uh, on this slide, uh, and that's advice, trend, and opportunities. And when it comes to advice for you, if you are not in the market uh, yet, my, my top advice would be uh, study the market carefully before entering. Um, it is very easy and it's very tempting to go for the first, uh, let's say, company that has reached out to you and, um, and ask if they may, may represent you. That might and often is not the best uh, way to do it. But of course, obviously, a positive thing that there is an interest in your product. But be careful, study the market carefully before you go into it. And then I write here, prepare for the long game. The reason I do that is, uh, as I mentioned before, Japan is a very relation-driven dri market. Build relations uh, and then you build loyalty because Japan is also known to be an incredibly loyal market once you are and have connections and orders with, with customers. Be aware, be, be aware of the pa paperwork. There are a lot of animal health requirements, veterinary health certificates you have to be aware of, you have to live up to. Uh, and uh, far too often we at the embassy see that, that companies may not have paid enough attention to this. Often we are able to help if uh, companies get into trouble and we would be, be very, uh, we are happy to do that. That's why, why we are here, but, but please pay attention and study those requirements carefully. Check ingredients. Ingredients can be somewhat of a stumbling block because ingredients allowed in Japan are not the same as the ones allowed, for example, in the EU. Um, gradually, more and more uh, ingredients become approved in Japan, but a lot of them are not. And if your products contain some of the ingredients that are not allowed, it will not be your products will not be allowed into the market. We can help you check that uh, quite easily. I, I have a local colleague who is uh, an expert within this area. Then I write, uh, check market preferences. I mean, yeah, Japan is a very different market in, in many ways. And when we, when we talk about uh, sizes, uh, Japan typically uh, prefers smaller sizes. Packaging is, is really important as well. Um, quality, of course, is, is a, an important element too. Sweetness, I mean, something as simple and basic as taste can be extremely different. And what we feel is very sweet or not very sweet, uh, uh, the Japanese consumer might find extremely sweet. Let me turn towards uh, some of the trends. E-commerce, uh, we see that uh, there is a tremendous growth in e-commerce. Um, I mentioned some of the platforms here, you know, you probably know them all, but uh, e-commerce in Japan represents a market value of about 4 trillion US dollars, out of which um, foods are only about 20 billion US dollars and expected to grow significantly. Then I write, don't forget the convenience stores. Uh, the convenience store sector represents a, a fair amount of the, the retail market. And just one example, I've shown it in the right side of this, uh, of this slide, 7-Eleven, with their 22,700 shops in Japan, compared to 175 in Denmark, is a major force when it comes to, to retail. One of, um, one of our very big 
uh, highly respected companies in Japan, Danish Crown, they actually supply bacon. And I bought this uh, salad. They supply only a few grams per, per salad pack. Uh, but because of the volume, they, uh, they supply about 75 tons a month for uh, 7-Eleven alone. So that is truly impressive. Then uh, plant-based foods, again, an area that is growing uh, fairly rapidly uh, in Japan and expected to grow rapidly in the years to come. From 2019 to 2022, uh, I believe the plant-based products have uh, doubled in Japan. Frozen uh, foods is um, becoming more and more popular as well. Convenience, convenience, convenience. It's a $66 billion market in Japan. Low alcohol beverages are continuously growing and uh, expected to seek uh, strong growth going forward as well. And pork and uh, processed uh, pork products are also in high demand. Then finally, as one of the last elements I want to mention when it comes to opportunities is when it comes to sustainability, which in my book at least comes, includes uh, animal welfare. We see and we hear from customers more and more and receive more and more questions about sustainability and animal welfare. So I think uh, you, it's, it's important for you to take notice on, on this and adjust your messaging according to this, as was also highlighted by uh, Lisa from the, ins, uh, from the Market Insight Report. Just uh, a few uh, slides, uh, just one slide here with some of the the uh, examples, uh, and, and I just want to spend a little bit of attention on the top right hand side of this slide. This again is 7 Eleven, as you can see. They have a clearly defined goal uh, saying that the 50% of the raw materials they use should be sustainably sourced by 2030 and 100% by uh, 2050. That kind of shows a direction, and we see more and more more Japanese companies investing in this uh, transition. Again, here are a few, um, a few important uh, points that again correspond quite well with the, uh, with the, uh, the, the insights that Lisa and uh, Mayenne uh, talked about. I will not spend too much time on this. Now, uh, my, my final slide in, in, in this presentation will be to highlight that we are here to help. We have a number of offerings, both from the embassy, but also from, uh, from Food Nation, from the trade organizations, that uh, you should actually take a careful look at. Uh, I just want to mention a few here. The, the, Danish, the new Danish Minister of Food, Agriculture and Fisheries, Mr. Jakob Jensen, is going to uh, Japan between March 6th and March 8th uh, this year. And this is done in connection with the Foodex exhibition in Japan. We are trying to put together a delegation. So if you want to consider participation or participate, participating in this event, please do uh, let me know or do let us know. Food Nation is heavily involved in this as well. Uh, one more possibility of getting exposure or getting your feet in, in, into the Japanese water is participating in what we call Danish Days in Daikanyama, which is an export promotion event where we have elements of both B2C and B2B. In the embassy courtyard, we have two days where you will be able to meet uh, Japanese consumers. Uh, last year, we had between uh, six to 9,000 uh, co uh, consumers going through the courtyard and uh, testing and trying sampling, and you may even sell your products there. So that's worthwhile considering. We have something we call Daikanyama Gourmet Academy, where we, uh, where, where we focus at the, uh, the food service uh, part of the market. Uh, four meetings a year where we invite uh, key decision makers within the Horeca segment, you may say. We are coming online with a Danish vending machine in the first half. I'm very proud of this because this will be a unique 
uh, way of, uh, of getting exposure for your products. It uh, will be placed outside the embassy. Then we will have the uh, centennial celebration of the first Danish farmers arriving to Japan. They are in the bottom of, uh, of this picture, Emil Fenger and his wife Frida. And finally, I want to mention in, in this connection, an amazing program that the Trade Council of Denmark just started called the SDG Accelerator Program. So if you want to make use of sustainability and SDGs uh, in, your, uh, in your communication, this is actually a, a very unique offering. And in, uh, in the appendix two to my presentation, and I believe uh, Food Nation will distribute it afterwards, you will have contact uh, points uh, and a link to where you can gain more information. Basically, you will be able to get up to 75 hours of um, consultancy from our side, and you will participate in workshops regarding how to use SDGs in your communication. I think it is very, very worthwhile and interesting to, uh, to uh, get, get to be a part of this uh, program. Now, I almost kept my promise and kept within the 15 minutes or 20 minutes i think but here are my contact points there are a couple more slides going into details about the the current exports and about this uh, sdg accelerator program that's it for me thank you once again for inviting me and feel free to contact me anytime if you have any questions thank you very much Thank you so much, Jesper, and I must say that I'm impressed about your um, uh, short and sweet presentation. You have kept the time perfect, <laughs> and uh, as uh, as Jesper said, we will share the presentation. We will share it in a recorded version afterwards. So um, I can see that we already have a, a question for Jesper, but uh, I I will take this question. Um, up in the Q&A session after uh, the presentation from yes, uh, Frank Rasmussen, the CEO of, of, uh, of Robite. So uh, Frank, please uh, turn on your camera and microphone. Yes, hello everyone. Good morning to uh, everyone dialing in from Denmark and afternoon to everyone dialing in from uh, Japan. Uh, I would like to say thank you very much as well for inviting me to do a small presentation from Robite and our activities in uh, Japan. Some of the findings are actually quite um, aligned with both the market study and also the comments made by Jesper. So hopefully that will confirm that uh, that we will be uh, similar on, on what you guys will also experience in the market. Um, very briefly about me, uh, my name, as mentioned, is Frank Rasmussen. I have uh, a little more than uh, 10 years uh, experience uh, working with export of Danish uh, products throughout the world and uh, currently uh, work uh, as the CEO of uh, Rawbite. I started in Rawbite approximately four years ago as the head of sales and recently took over the positions as, as a CEO. Um, before I, I go into to depth with uh, our experiences and so on, I know that some of you are maybe much bigger uh, in relation to, to uh, your uh, situation in, uh, in Japan. Um, so we are still operating within a fairly small uh, niche area, uh, yet we still have uh, almost 10 years uh, of presence in Japan and therefore have some learnings and recommendations that we'll be happy to share uh, to those of you who might be new in the in the market. Um, but before I, I start with it, I'll just do a short presentation to Rawbite. To those of you who, who do not know our company or products, then uh, Rawbite is a Danish company which was uh, started in 2009 by three guys who um, really wanted to find a very clean and uh, pure snack product. Uh, one of the guys, he was a little bit of a sport freak, if you can say, uh, doing a lot of marathon running and triathlon and so on. And when he wanted a snack for in between, he realized that most of the energy bars and uh, protein bars and so on, they were filled with uh, additives and E numbers and ingredients that he didn't understand. So that's how it came about that they wanted to make a pure and simple product that you could eat with good conscience when you wanted a snack for in between. 
Um, today, uh, Rawbite is present in approximately 30 countries throughout the world, primarily in Europe, but also a bit in Asia and uh, the Middle East. We have our own production and headquarter located here in uh, close to Copenhagen in Bowser. And, um, and in, if we look at Japan on its own, we have been present in Japan, as mentioned, uh, since 2012, so approximately 10 years. Um, and although uh, we, are not, we have uh, grown significantly, we have had a controlled growth in Japan and always uh, stayed through to our focus of where we wanted to be present. But I'll get back to that uh, a little bit later in, in the presentation. So very uh, briefly, just raw bite as a product is very simple to explain. It's a few basic ingredients that we um, mix together, such as dates, almonds, and cashews. And then we have the final product, which is organic fruit and nut bar. So all of our products are organic, vegan, no added sugar, and gluten-free. And on this slide, I also um, added the small line of high-quality certificates. This is very much in, in line as to what uh, Jesper mentioned when it comes to making sure that you know your ingredient, ingredients, making sure that you, that you have your certifications in place. The Japanese uh, people and consumers, they're very detailed oriented. And every time that we send a shipment to Japan, it's being controlled in detail by the, um, by, uh, by the import uh, in Japan. So make sure that you have the resources available in-house to support your, your export uh, afterwards to uh, Japan. Um, also, if we move forward to the portfolio, then um, from our point of view, we have our basic portfolio of nine, of nine different flavors of 50 gram bars. Uh, what I recommend, and also in line to what Jesper uh, mentioned, is study the Japanese market uh, before you enter. Um, it might be somewhat similar to enter the neighboring countries uh, here from Denmark, such as Sweden and so on. But the Japanese uh, consumers, they could have different tastes and preferences. So um, I know, for example, uh, from previous companies, when uh, sending products to Middle East and Southeast Asia and so on, uh, there were some um, additions made to the, to the product. So they, for example, were a, a bit more sweeter for those regions. From our point of view, we've been very lucky with our um, findings in Japan that they actually like and prefer our standard portfolio. So that obviously has made it a little bit easier bringing our standard portfolio to the Japanese uh, consumers. But as mentioned, I recommend that maybe you find a local partner, depending on your strategy, whether you go directly, but otherwise a local partner that knows the market that can do some studies and testing for you before you ship your, your containers to uh, Japan. Um, also, obviously, it's needed to have uh, Japanese writing and, and labeling uh, on your products. Um, in our point of view, we have not made uh, localized, um, um, how do you say, packaging for Japan. We have kept with our current packaging, but adding, adding labels. And we've been told and have experienced that actually this is sometimes an advantage because then the imported product from, from Europe and Denmark becomes somewhat exotic to the Japanese consumer. Uh, obviously, you can also adapt your packaging, uh, but even if doing so, uh, depending on your strategy, maybe it's still an advantage to keep some uh, Danish or even English language on the packaging to make sure that you have that little bit of differentiation versus the um, Japanese products, which are, of course, very good and very well represented uh, on the shelves as well. Um, also, uh, as mentioned, as uh, Jesper mentioned, regarding the size and taste, we also had a look into this. So, for example, our 50 gram bar is uh, to some of the Japanese uh, consumers a little bit big, uh, especially maybe for the younger generation and also the women. Uh, therefore, we looked at uh, now uh, making new products. So, for example, we created this office snack box where we took in the Japanese consumers uh, into consideration when developing this product because we then will come with a smaller size, which potentially could be uh, launched in, in Japan as well. So again, you don't have to adapt straight away, but of course take into consideration that there might be somewhat uh, different uh, 
um, consumer preferences in, in Japan. And going on to the target group, well, we also uh, thought that are the Japanese consumers similar to the Danish consumers? Can we just bring our product to Japan and then expect everything to be, to be good? Uh, if we look at our target group, well, it's both male and female uh, within 20 and 50 years old. And so uh, with high, somewhat high uh, educational background and interested in their lifestyle and what they consume. So obviously we said, well, these uh, consumers must be uh, in, in Japan as well. And fortunately the, they were. And even though they might be uh, used to uh, snacking different types of products, uh, we have actually been very successful in, in uh, branding our type of European or, or Northern uh, snack products to the Japanese consumers as well. So they might have a somewhat different understanding uh, of, for example, organic, as it was also mentioned from this study, uh, the Japanese consumers, when they think organic, they think maybe a little bit more about uh, sustainability and, and how are you producing your, your products and not necessarily, as we understand, uh, only at, that it is organic, but a little bit broader in relation to production and sustainability and so on. So overall, of course, with a population of 125 million, you can find uh, similar target groups to, to what you are looking for when, when going to uh, Japan, of course. Um, also, in relation to, at least from our experience, when we uh, wanted to communicate our product and so on, uh, we needed to make sure, can we just use more or less the same communication strategy as we've been using in Denmark and Europe? And uh, again, also here, it has been quite positive because the Japanese uh, consumers, they like our colorful environment. Uh, they always want to know why they should buy the product. They're a little, as mentioned, more detail oriented. So it's important that you always communicate the reason or the why uh, they should pick your product. So for example, us is the very natural and basic ingredients that we focus on communicating and uh, the colorful environment. So instead of being organic and maybe being a little bit earthy and brown and dark green uh, colors, we have a colorful universe that fits to the Japanese consumer. So of course, depending on your product and, and strategy, uh, you should adapt, but um, most of the time you'll find that they are very open towards uh, European communication and, uh, and design. And um, we also use this a little bit in the in the marketing and so on. Uh, as uh, Jesper mentioned, uh, the embassy has the Danish days in Dakanyama, and uh, we also participated in, in that, for example, uh, in, the, in the autumn last year. And uh, it's a great way to uh, meet the local Japanese consumers. There were thousands of people visiting just within uh, those few days, and you, are, you get to interact and understand the Japanese consumers and their preferences as well. So I highly recommend that. Uh, also, of course, uh, the normal um, PR and uh, presence in the stores and so on is a given, um, but it's definitely something that you need to find out where is your target group and, of course, how do you um, how do you uh, find them in in Japan? Just moving uh, on very briefly to the strategy. Then, um, in our uh, opinion, it's better that you have a somewhat focused strategy in uh, in Japan. Japan versus Denmark is, of course, a very big market with uh, with um, 125 million people. But don't get blinded by that, and maybe make sure that you can grow in a controlled manner. So, for example, from our side, we uh, focused and are still focusing on being present in the high-end organic stores such as uh, National uh, Asabu and Biusibong and so on. That's where we are present in, in Japan, and we are focusing on the main cities as well. Uh, just by being present in, in Tokyo and some of the main cities, you will have, still have a population of more than uh, 20 uh, million people that you can target. Uh, and in stores such as National Asabu and so on, approximately 70% of their products are imported. So it's a very good way for you if you have organic products, of course, to find uh, the, the target group that you're looking for. There's, of course, also a very, very interesting opportunity when it comes to convenience. As uh, Jesper mentioned, 7-Eleven and Family Mart and so on are very big chains out there 
with thousands of stores. So you can get blinded maybe by the great opportunities, but also be aware that uh, you that as quick as it can start, as quick it can finish. They are very strict in order for delivery times and quality and so on. So again, our recommendation is that there's great opportunities, but do it maybe in a somewhat controlled uh, manner to start with. And then finally, I'll just uh, do a short uh, sum up and recommendations. Some of it might be somewhat basic to, to those of you who are already real present in, in uh, Japan, but for others of you, maybe you can uh, use it. So similar to Jesper mentioned, analyze and study the market. Make sure that you have a clear go-to uh, market plan. Uh, and in our opinion, we work with a local distributor and find that very helpful because Japanese um, business partners, but just in general, are very much relation oriented. So our local partner has a very good network and therefore, of course, it helped to, uh, to enter the, the market and the places where we want it to be. Then, as I mentioned, make sure you have the right uh, product mix and price strategy. Yes, again, it's a somewhat given, but uh, rather test it and, and do a slow start in the beginning. Make sure that it fits to the Japanese consumers. And then if needed, uh, adapt uh, afterwards or before you enter in big volume uh, to the market. And then, uh, as also mentioned, make sure that you have the certifications, that you have the resources available to follow up because you will experience that they will ask for even the small zero point uh, something uh, digital in relation to your ingredients and, uh, and recipe and, and so on. So they are very, very detail oriented. It's one of the, in my opinion, toughest markets to, to enter and to please when it comes to that. But once you are in place with this, you, they are also very loyal and you have a very good uh, long-term uh, relationship. And then, uh, yeah, summing up, the main cities and a few controlled um, uh, stores is probably what we would also recommend, of course, depending on the product and and strategy. So finally, um, I also recommend, similar to Jespa, participate in local events. The event held by the um, embassy was uh, very positive to us. We were able to meet a lot of interesting business partners and also uh, the end consumers. So take your time and uh, good luck with Japan. It's a uh, it's a tough market in the beginning, even though there's great opportunities, but uh, in the long terms, it's very beneficial and a very exciting market to operate in. So that's all from my side, and I hope that it was uh, a little bit useful to some of you. Thank you. Good. Thank you so much, Frank, for, for this uh, insightful uh, presentation about your experiences on the Japanese market. Uh, I was listening very interested in, in uh, during all the slides, uh, and uh, I can imagine that the, uh, the participants oh, sorry, uh, also thought this was very uh, fruitful information. So I would like to uh, invite uh, Jesper back on the screen together with us. So we will have uh, a short uh, Q&A session. And uh, we have um, a question. I can see it, it's for, uh, for Jesper. But while we are waiting uh, for him to show up, maybe we could ask you, Frank, about if you should say uh, one key success factor uh, for, for raw bite entering the Japanese market, did you meet a, a specific person or did you participate at a specific event or, or what was it that really uh, gave you a, a good start? So from our point of view, of course, it, it depends on the situation and the company and so on. but. We, uh, from the beginning, um, teamed up with a local distributor and partner in the market. Um, of course, some people might say we'll go directly to some of the bigger chains, which you most definitely can do. But just be aware, uh, as mentioned, they are very detail oriented. And, the, and a lot of it is in relation to relation building. So if you were to go directly with a, a chain such as 7-Eleven, for example, it's a, you can get blindsided by the volume and the opportunities, which are very exciting, of course. But, uh, but if something goes wrong, you need to make sure that you are there or that you have a local partner that can assist you. So, so you pay the respect and you, you apologize if that's needed and so on. It's a very high context uh, environment versus the low context in Denmark. We are very straightforward, but if you have a local partner 
that can uh, assist you in the networking and how to act in the market, I certainly uh, recommend that. Okay, thank you. And I can see that Jesper has, uh, has a comment, maybe on, on that. Yeah. I Yes, I, I just want to say it is actually the king of all advice, finding the right partner. It is crucial, and yet it is one of the hardest things to do, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but, but it is of tremendous importance, and that obviously is something we also can can help with and will, would like to help with uh, in case that you want to scan the market and, and, and scan the poss possible uh, partners uh, for your for your products in in Japan, but yes. But uh, very, just very sorry important. to interrupt, Jesper. Uh, I was just uh, going back to Frank again. Frank, how did you do it? How did you find your uh, obviously successful distributor in Japan? Could you just elaborate on that? Yeah. Well, um, actually, we we found our distributor through a, a big food uh, fair here in Europe. So, for example, there's the uh, Anuga in Germany, and there's also Biofag in Nuremberg in Germany, focusing on organic products. And we went there with the intention to find distributors. Uh, honestly, the intention was not to find a Japanese distributor at that point in time, but uh, our uh, distributor was quite interested in our products. And we thought, well, why not uh, look at this market? I mean, you have one strategy, and it shouldn't be a you know, uh, strategy just uh, where opportunities uh, arise, you should have it somewhat controlled. But here we had a very, very interested uh, business partner. We said, okay, versus the other leads we have, let's give it a try and get the learnings from uh, sending our products outside of Europe because this, uh, there are some challenges when it comes to that as well. So, uh, so we tried it and did it in a small, controlled uh, way and then uh, realized that uh, that was actually a a great way to, to do it so yeah thank you wow so it, it really gives sense to participate at all those uh, fairs uh, around the world because uh, yeah you can meet some really interesting people there well uh, we have some questions regarding uh, organic specific uh, and i will just mix the two questions because we have a questions about uh wait. Uh, how uh, organic uh, is understood in uh, in Japan, how to own, unfold the, the organic in Japan, but also a question about uh, the organic logo for food uh, in Japan. Is it mandatory to export it, uh, to use it when exporting to Japan? So maybe, uh, yeah, you, yes, but would like to, to start with the with the questions about let, the loop. Let, let, let me start with the, the, the last question you mentioned here. Um, obviously, it's not mandatory to use the organic logo. It's an advantage. And in the homepage of the Danish Agricultural Agency, you will actually be able to find a lot of detailed information about uh, what the Japanese rules and regulations are in this regard. But just let me say, this between EU and Japan, there is an uh, organic equivalency agreement. So if you are producing plant based products, you're automatically approved for Japan. So you can export your products as they are. There are some paperwork it's described in the, pay, uh, in the page uh, I mentioned, and I will share that with you so you can distribute afterwards. Now, if you are exporting animal-based products, either you have to be individual cer uh, certified by a, a accreditation uh, a bureau uh, from uh, either the, the, uh, from Germany, UK or Italy, but um, we are working towards having uh, plant-based or animal-based products uh, covered by an uh, equivalency agreement. But let me say, you are allowed to put bio or bio on the products. Uh, uh, but, uh, but you are not allowed to call products organics or use the, the Japanese jazz logo. But let me share the link so you can read more about what the require, specific requirements are. I think it's a bit too detailed to get into that here. Thank you. And if we uh, should uh, have a look on the question on, on unfolding how organic is understood in Japan, Frank, you, you talked about that uh, it, it was associated to also to have a sustainable production. Um, could you say some more words about uh, this definition? Or yeah, well, I just believe in, in our experience, we had a, 
Japanese delegation coming visiting us in the uh, in end of November, actually. Um, so we had uh, roughly 10 people coming here. And that's when we realized even more than what we already knew beforehand that, that maybe they are, as mentioned, they are ahead when it comes to fashion and excitement and, and all that and buildings. But when it comes to organic, they have maybe skipped a few steps because the decision makers and the people in the in the stores and retails, they are now becoming interested in organic, but the general population uh, might have somewhat different understanding of organic. They are, they are not confusing it, but they're putting it similar to sustainable, in my opinion. So, so when they ask, is your, uh, is your product organic? Yes, it is. Okay, so that means, uh, you know, more of, they're focusing on all other kind of uh, questions and so on. Uh, in relation to sustainability. So what about the energy that you use and so on? And I think it's it's only positive because they, they might skip a few steps and go directly to a bigger picture. But it's just to be aware that uh, when you communicate organic, they might perceive it somewhat a little bit different. But again, they always want to know the why. Why buy a product? Why is it organic? What makes it organic and so on? So communicate these whole details uh, very clearly with the, with the Japanese consumers. And, and we do have a few more questions regarding the understanding of different uh, attributes which we stand strong in in Denmark. And, and we do not have the time to elaborate on all that right here and now, but I would really recommend you to take a look at the inside report where we have thorough um, investigation of how the Japanese decision makers really look at these uh, areas. So I think that would be the recommendation uh, from my side. Uh, Denmark stands strong in these really important areas in Japan. Mm -hmm. Yes, so um, so um, I would like to say thank you to both of you, Jesper and Frank, and also to all our participants. I hope you uh, you find this uh, very uh, yeah, fruitful uh, information, and we will send you the recorded version afterwards and links to to the organic uh, regulations in Japan. Uh, and the, and also the inside report where we can find much more uh, information about uh, the news data uh, when we look at B2B decision makers on the Japanese market. So um, thank you to uh, to all of you, uh, and uh, we hope to see you uh, to uh, the Evening. next fairs and yeah. uh, to the next events uh, that we have. Maybe if I could just invite you to take uh, an extra tour in the new virtual universe that we have uh, created in Food Nation. So if you have the time to browse around in this uh, universe, it's a really good idea also to get even closer on the opportunities within the different strongholds. Uh, we will share a short video uh, in the end of this webinar. So also from my side, thank you so much for participating, all of you. Thank you. Yep. See you. Thank Bye. you very much. Thank Good you. luck, everyone. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Welcome to Food Nation's Always On Virtual Universe, where you can explore and experience Danish agriculture and food sector strongholds and solutions across the value chain. The lobby is the starting point. And from here, you can navigate to all touch points in the universe. In the bottom left-hand corner, you'll find the experience panel with a brief introduction to the universe, direct access to the strongholds and links to our social media accounts. Navigate to Meet Food Nation to learn more about the public-private partnership and services and get in touch with our team. Request a physical or digital tour in one of our visitor centers. Dive into eight strongholds within sustainability, innovative technology, food quality and safety, ingredients, health, organic food production, gastronomy, and the unique Danish way of collaborating. Navigate to a case library to browse more than a hundred different cases from the Danish agriculture and food sector across multiple categories. In the breakout lobby, you'll find three breakout rooms, the global food talks, insights and food dialogues. In addition to participating in a wide range of webinars, you can explore previous webinars and publications, sign up to a newsletter and dive into United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals. You will also find the Academy of Sustainable Value Chains, showcasing how Danish products and solutions can contribute to a more sustainable food system. 
Here, you can dive into the different value chains, dairy and pig. If you're interested in the dairy sector, you can explore and get insights about the different steps of the value chain. If you're seeking information about the pig sector, you can dive into the different steps of the value chain, explore cases and visit relevant companies. Have a look around and enjoy Food Nation's virtual universe.